ministers, uh, generals, directors, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I don't know if you remember this moment on February 24, 2022, when you learned about Russia's attack on Ukraine. What were are you doing at that precise moment? We call the circumstances in which you received the information that morning, whether someone informed you or you checked your phone, regardless of the means, you were struck. It was honestly hard to believe. Later that day, on February 24, you saw pictures on a screen of a column of Russian tanks crossing the border, uh, perhaps as I did, you initially thought it was History Channel, a documentary about World War II, only to realize that the images were just a few, a few hours ago. You probably, probably gradually sensed that a world-shifting event was taking place. Frankly, it was astonishing, surprising, and almost <coughs> inconceivable. Before February 24, who would have imagined that nearly two years later, in Europe, there would be hundreds of thousands killed and wounded, cities destroyed, thousands of fighter jets shut down, warships sunk, and even threats of nuclear weapons being used or at least implied? Who would have imagined that four member states of the European Union would share a border with a country at war under attack and itself a candidate for EU membership? To address the consequences of this dra dramatic event, I am especially pleased uh, that this conference could be co-organized by Eastern Circles and the French Defense University. I want to warmly thank Eastern Circles for their amazing and effective, effective work. This event is uh, important to us, not only because we welcome all of you in this splendid location, though a little uh, rainy today at the Ecole Militaire, a place that has been the core of elaborating our military strategy, thoughts, and doctrine for uh, over tw 200 years. And, but uh, this uh, military school has taken a new dimension with the development of the French Defense University. Let me briefly tell you what this French Defense University means. France Defense uh, University is a newly established organization in the field of strategic studies. It was inaugurated on October 26th by Sébastien Lecornu, you know that is the French Minister of the Armed Forces. The French Defense University is a federation, in fact, of 22, 22 institutions set up in the École Militaire, including, for example, the Institute for Higher National Defense Studies, uh, which I commend, the French War College, the French John Staff College, and numerous doctrine and uh, think tanks, doctrine centers and think tanks. All of these institutions provide training for leaders uh, and decision makers, conduct research, publish publications, and organize events on defense, security, and international affairs. Um, but what sets this institution apart is probably the close integration of scholars for all uh, disciplines of the university with actors from the defense sector, defense sector with rich operational experience. Now, not only will they interact and enhance their efficiency through document sharing, logistics synergies, and better connections between researchers, but as the president of this university, I also aim at strengthening our ties with like-minded institutions of our partners and allies. 
we want to actively participate in debates on different strategy and geopolitics. This event today is the first international event we organize. And I invite all of you to follow our uh, activity on our website and to connect, to contact us to build partnerships with our institutions. There will be many other opportunities to act together. And I, uh, today, I invite you to save the date of March 13 and 14 to attend the Paris Defense and Strategy Forum that we will organize here at the Ecole Militaire. Uh, today's program is indeed very comprehensive, and I'd like to, f to ask a few questions as food, food for thought throughout our four panels. First, I think we should ask ourselves, is the war in Ukraine an anachronism, a lingering remnant of past conflicts misplaced in the 21st century? or behind the guise of a falsely uh, classical confrontation, does it instead mask the precursor of a new kind of conflicts? The significance of this question is substantial, as the answer carries weight for the decision that armed forces and states worldwide will have to make in the future, and more importantly, perhaps, the answer shapes our ability to anticipate the evolution of this particular conflict and to uh, devise our strategy. Uh, second, what are the connections between the various aspects of the war uh, correctly identified by today's program? Diplomacy, economy, information, and the military side of the uh, issue are indeed four, four uh, crucial facets of the war. But how do they interact? More specifically, what cause and effect relationships uh, may we discern? What level of autonomy does the information war hold? Another way, way to phrase this question is to inquire whether when we discuss information war, war is used as an analogy or if it refers to the real phenomenon in a close fiction manner. And third, with this expensive crisis with global repercussion, what specific points should we observe more uh, cautiously in the coming months? Are there particular trends that uh, warrant careful <coughs> monitoring to anticipate the evolution of the conflict and in its consequence consequences on the world stage. Uh, I think all of these uh, questions we have in mind are uh, indeed very important. I think the four uh, magnificent panels you have uh, uh, built, to, you have uh, gathered, uh, should provide us with significant um, uh, clue about that. And uh, that's the reason why I uh, wish you uh, an excellent and fruitful day, and again, thank you again for your uh, the organization. Thank you, General. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Anastasia Shapachkina. I am president of Eastern Circles, a French geoeconomic think tank working on energy and defense in Eastern Europe. Uh, today's uh, conference is uh, really a privilege. It's a privilege uh, to be here. We are very honored. We are very happy. And uh, I'd like to start uh, by thanking uh, Guillaume Lasconderias, especially director for R&D of IHEDN, with whom we were organizing very closely the content, the speakers, and the logistics, which was the most, <laughs> the most difficult part and the most exciting, as you know, for any conference. Uh, and thank you very much, Guillaume. Alexia Graf, also. <laughs> 
Now, Yashadeen, who helped us to uh, organize uh, the uh, communication and to prepare as well on these issues. Darina Marina Patyuk from Eastern Circles, uh, who uh, is our communications director and who is an integral part as well of this organization, uh, as well uh, as uh, Eugenia Komarovska, who is now taking pictures, will be a photograph for this event, so everybody can come out with really presentable photos for, uh, for, the, for the organization. And the excellent two teams of volunteers one team from IHEDN and one team from CNSPO. Thank you very much for coming and for helping us out. Uh, usually the thank you words are addressed in the end and thus somebody always gets forgotten. I'm trying to do it while it's still fresh. And uh, so we, uh, of course, when we were planning this, we were thinking and you know, that uh, the event and the content, we were thinking very often in France, especially you turn on LCI, you know, and they have made an editorial decision to devote half of a day to Ukraine from the very outset of the war. And often, as the war progresses, you find yourself listening to reportage about Makivka, while here in France, it's far away, and there are very nitty-gritty details, logistics, and all this, and you think, goodness, you know, how how much do people actually understand when they look, listen to a very detailed reportage about a village and what's going on there today. While uh, we thought also that there's too much focus on the military, this is an important focus, it's the crucial moment, but we are going to try to geopolitically zoom out of it and thus, as the general said, think about the overall picture, what makes up the war, and where is the war today on the four fronts, along which we, which, uh, we have structured our four panels. The first panel will start with information wars, where uh, we'll be welcoming uh, the uh, former Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Hanna Maler. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, we are going to also welcome American expert on information wars from Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Ivana Stradner. Thank you for coming. She's going to give us the American perspective and what is going on there with Russian propaganda. Very important, since, of course, we know uh, how important and how big influence it plays on the upcoming American elections. <clears throat> we also have the pleasure and the honor to welcome International Republican Institute, a director for Kyiv office, uh, Michael Druckmann. Thank you, Michael, for coming. <clears throat> and also Jean Cavalier, Reporter Sans Frontières. Jean, I hope you are here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming as well, who's going to present the French and more international also outlook on the Russian propaganda. Then we're going to have a little stretching break, which usually means there is no coffee, but actually there is coffee. You've seen it downstairs. Don't hesitate to go down and to help yourself, because I think that a lot of people were in a rush and some of us have maybe skipped breakfast. And then we're going to dive into the second pillar of the war, after the information, the economic war, uh, which, uh, sorry, uh, for the information war, I forgot, of course, to mention the most important, the moderator. The moderator is Jonathan Fink, who is a British uh, commentator and uh, uh, on the Silicon Curtain podcast. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the second panel, an economic war, will be moderated by Guillaume Lascongerias of Vichelian, that we've just, uh, that, uh, that, that, that is one of the co-organizers and real lead organizer. Uh, and we'll have three speakers there, Alexandra Mosienko, who from the Center for Military uh, uh, Strategy and uh, from Kyiv. Thank you, Alexander. We'll also uh, welcome Stefano Drar, who is the consultant on defense and security and Artem Shevalov from EBRD, who's uh, taking a very early train from London and who will join us uh, just before that panel, so he's not yet in the room. We'll then break for lunch and reconvene at two, if you have the courage, for the, one of the most interesting panels, and I'm overselling it, not because the other two are less interesting, but because it's going to be the afternoon. You have to have the courage to keep going. So... Take heart, we are going to have a fantastic panel on diplomatic wars, where we are going to look into how has the system of international alliances shifted and changed since the outset of the war. In particular, we are, going, we are welcoming here the Indian expert on Russia and Eastern Europe, Swasti Rao, who's joining us from the Monaha Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi, which is the institute, uh, the partner of IHEDN and Ministry of the Army, participates regularly in their meetings on Asia-Pacific. Thank you, Swasti, for taking the, the travel. 
Uh, we are going to also welcome Niagale Bagayoko, chair of the African Security Sector Network, uh, on, who's going to tell us about uh, Africa and its role in the war as an ally, either Russia or Ukraine. We're going to uh, then, and uh, Nia Gale is going to uh, join us also right before the panels. She has um, a class in the morning, she's teaching a class. The, we're going to then switch to the European allies with Hennady Maksak from Ukrainian <laughs> Prism, uh, leading Ukrainian think tank on foreign policy, uh, which does every year, publishes a report on Ukraine foreign policy review. And of course, their 2022 report was very different from 2021 reports since it covered all the new host of countries and Ukraine is discovering all of the what we call global south for the most part just as the global south is discovering ukraine which is in itself a blessing and a curse so that's what gennady is going to address and finally we have velina chakarova on zoom due to covid unfortunately uh, who is a leading austrian expert on russia china relations <clears throat> so velina is going to is just already on zoom she's already with us and she's going to join us for this panel we'll then have a quick stretching break and for the final and of course, you were not surprised we left that subject for the very end to make sure that people really stay to the end. Uh, at 3.15, we'll be talking about military strategy and practice. And we are going to do this with General Breton from CISDE. Uh, he's not there yet, uh, and he's going to join us just for that, uh, from that panel. And uh, Olena Trehub from NACO, a leading uh, Ukrainian uh, NGO for fighting corruption in the military defense industry. And, uh, the, and the conclusion is going to be delivered by Alexandra Matvichuk, just after that panel, the Nobel Peace uh, Laureate uh, of 2022, who's going to join us by Zoom from the Center for Civil Liberties. Uh, we are going to structure our discussions in a dynamic way. So most likely you're going to see very few PowerPoint slides, for better or worse for better or worse. And uh, it's going to be structured, every discussion is going to be structured in an interview fashion mm -hmm. where each speaker, and please speakers, remember this, has about three minutes to answer each question. Okay? The questions are going to be posed by the moderators. The word is going to be passed speaker to speaker. So you will speak several times. Don't worry. Please stick to the three minutes. I'm sure everybody is usually very disciplined, and I'm sure we're going to have no problem with that at all. And uh, then after uh, several rounds of questions, we're going to open up to the public because, of course, our goal is to exchange with you, to hear you, and uh, uh, to have you also ask the questions that interest you. And... Uh, very much looking forward to the exciting discussion we're going to have. I um, invite to the stage, please, the moderator, Jonathan Pink from Silicon Curtain, Anna Maler, former Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Ivana Stradner of the Foundation for Defense Democracies, De Jean Cavalier, Reporter Sans Frontières, and Michael Druckmann, International Republican Institute, Kyiv Office. Thank you. And if you would like to grab a program, you can do so during the break. They're right here on the front desk. Great. Let's test these. Can you hear me okay? Um, so we're not going to do a big introduction. Uh, just, a, just a short summary of information warfare. It's quite a big subject. And based on the panel we've got, there are going to be different focuses, different areas of expertise, because Russia puts a vast amount of money into information warfare, many, many tens of millions of dollars a year. Um, but it varies as well. It varies massively, whether it's internal propaganda, uh, whether it's external, and it varies according to the audience as well. Um, so we're going to start off by asking a question which is common to the entire panel, and then we're going to have individual questions that are tailored for each of our experts. Um, and then I think there's a Q&A uh, afterwards uh, for a couple of minutes to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Um, everyone's been introduced, so we're going to dive straight into the questions. Um, and this is a common question for the entire panel. Uh, and we'll, 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 start, uh, we'll start with Gunnar at the end. Um, and this question is about the mechanics and the narratives of Russian disinformation it varies internally and varies externally. 
by country and region. Uh, it will even vary as to whether they're targeting, say, Eastern Ukraine, Western Ukraine, different audiences, and so on. Each speaker is going to hopefully give us a slightly <coughs> different angle on that question. But please, what are the mechanics, the main mechanics and narratives of Russian disinformation in your view? Uh, I'm going to help Hannah with translation. Uh, she understands English, but uh, asked to speak in Ukrainian to be able to fully express her thoughts without uh, limited vocabulary. Hanna, the question is, what is the mechanic of Russian disinformation? How does it work? Russians are creating disinformation as a factory. The Russians are creating treating disinformation like an industry, like an industrial factory. The key source are telegram channels. They narrate dozens of imagined stories a day. This is not the worst problem for Ukraine, though. Насправді в інформаційній сфері фейки і пропаганда Росії відійшли на другий чи навіть третій план. In the information space of Ukraine, Russian fakes and propaganda are now in the background. Відбувся дуже несподіваний феномен. Українці протягом першого місяця повномасштабного вторгнення навчились дуже добре відрізняти, де російська пропаганда і російські фейки. The unexpected phenomenon of the war is that since the first months of the war, Ukrainians have learned to distinguish very well between the fakes, the Russian propaganda, and the information which is, which is communicated officially or which is communicated by the true media. Their propaganda has two major goals. The first is the discreditation of Ukraine as the, reception, as the receiver of Western military aid, and the second is discreditation of the mobilization effort. This is to be expected, since the two criteria for winning the war are people and arms. Тому в Україні їхня пропаганда працює над тим, щоб зірвати мобілізацію, а в європейських країнах і в Сполучених Штатах вони працюють над тим, щоб дискредитувати Україну як отримувача зброї. So in Ukraine their propaganda is targeting to discredit mobilization effort and in the West it is targeting to discredit Ukraine as the receiver of western military aid. Thank you. Uh, let's work our way down the panel from right to left then. So, uh, Michael, next, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> if I could pull back just a little bit on this question. So where we were in February 2022 uh, with Russia's disinformation campaign in Ukraine, and this was a, a campaign that was both aimed at internal audiences in Ukraine and external. In many cases, messages that we now see being used outside of Ukraine were first deployed and tested inside the country. These ideas of Nazis in Ukraine, we have fascists, we have language discrimination, East, West, EU, NATO, often uh, these were heightened many times, much more in mag magnification around election periods. But if you actually looked at these messages, particularly during COVID, in 2020, IRI conducted a survey of social media messaging in 10 of Ukraine's largest cities around local elections. And what were the messages coming out in that campaign where you still had political parties representing Kremlin interests? You still had people like Viktor Medvedchuk, Yuri Boyko, others who have fled or are now wanted, running political parties like Opposition Platform. You had programs run by people like Yuri Murayev, who in the weeks before Russia's full-scale invasion, you would see his billboard all over Kyiv. Uh, but those messages of Ukraine has biolabs, NATO biolabs that are preparing uh, to produce vaccines that will, we all know, all that line. Uh, Soros and the IMF are running Ukraine through uh, these new servants of the people. 
you saw these messages all over Facebook being replicated by these actors, but when you actually tested quantitatively in national public opinion surveys, what did Ukrainians think of these messages? They did not resonate at all. But fast forward, and what do we see? We see now Western, say, agents or useful idiots of the Kremlin dipping into this reservoir of thousands of Facebook posts, stories on, let's say, substandard media platforms in Ukraine, and there's now this track record that they can dip into to keep talking about these issues. Moving to where we are right now, you know, these now have become externalized, a lot of these issues. Inside Ukraine, these vulnerabilities have really been closed off. Recent polling by IRI and others shows that over 80% of Ukrainians would support joining the EU. Over 80% would support joining NATO. These numbers are phenomenal, and they're happening in the absence of an information campaign by the EU or NATO. And where it's most remarkable is that it's in eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine that have completely switched their preference. Where before they were against NATO because it would be a provocation towards Russia during the Minsk process, there's no reason to hold back. Russia has shown its cards, and we've seen the country completely shift. So on these classical issues, where Russia was looking not just to interfere politically, but will now look to delay and obfuscate Ukraine's path towards the European Union and NATO, that window is closing. Those opportunities have been reduced thanks to Putin's invasion. I would argue that where Russia was vis-a-vis -vis delaying Ukraine's accession into transatlantic institutions and its statehood was in a far better place on February 20th, 2022, than it was 48 hours later and that they actually had a plan that was quietly and silently working within the country to consolidate this anti-Kremlin base, to, again, to delay, not have an outright majority, but delay and create major issues for Ukrainians. But lastly, just to say in terms of how this is being combated externally, one of the missed opportunities, I know we'll return to this, and I think Gennady will talk about this in, in his panel as well, is unfortunately we haven't seen Ukrainian diplomacy get out in front of many of these issues that for us are quite silly, absurd. We know Ukrainians don't believe them, but unfortunately it's taken almost 20 months to see an embassy in Washington get outside of Washington and start engaging with average Americans in Europe to start moving out of Brussels and start engaging at a more local level. I think we've really forgotten this people-to-people -people diplomacy and we're over-reliant on Twitter, funny memes, and these other avenues that have been so successful and amusing but I would argue that we've missed this people-to-people -people connection on countering disinformation. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And there's some good points there, and I'll come back to Hannah with, with some of those, actually, because I think there's some good strategic importance of, of why some of those propaganda narratives are being made. But, Pauline, let's, let's turn to you next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, in terms of disinformation and the means of uh, use by Russia to disseminate its disinformation, it's... Russia is using very insidious ways to disseminate disinformation in Ukraine. And first of all, I can I completely uh, agree with Anna Maria in its, its use of YouTube and tele Telegram channels, especially Telegram anonymous channels who spread disinformation in Ukraine on a daily basis. So narratives, we all know them, but it's always good to remind them. It's like uh, Ukraine being the puppet of NATO, that uh, NATO provoked, provoked the invasion of Russia, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, that uh, Ukraine is uh, pulled by, by Nazis, and so, on, and so on and so forth. The thing is like to clearly identify what is this information and what is not, it is needed to have a huge and high level of media liter literacy, because right now some telegram channel information are taken as media information but this is not the same so this is to my opinion a huge challenge that need to be carried on not only in ukraine but in uh, in many different countries ivana um thank you very much for organizing this event and i would like to actually zoom out of this question and maybe to think about the big picture view of russian strategy because the Kremlin has been using information as a weapon. Oftentimes when we talk here in the West about information operations, we often think about you know, some random propaganda or uh, uh, some you know, just simple disinformation campaigns. No, this is the key for Russian national security. If you read carefully Russian national security strategies, they openly say that non-kinetic to kinetic 
use of force, they value four to one. Russian military strategists also say that who has information superiority will win on the battlefield. And this is why I firmly believe that this war will not be won on the battlefield. This war is also about perception. And everything I want to repeat, all the messages that we heard so far, but those messages make the perception globally. And unless we can compete with the Kremlin on this battlefield, we are doomed to fail. Um, I also want to emphasize that uh, I, what we have heard, how Ukraine has been um, fiercely pushing uh, Russian propaganda domestically, Russia is still doing quite well, not only in the West, but also in the global South. And while some of us, I hope most of us, are going to laugh about allegedly US biolab that are training migratory birds to deliver bioweapons uh, to Russia to specifically kill the Russians, such messages are well and alive across the board. And um, as I also want to just one more thing to emphasize, unless we really perceive this important part of the battlefield in the way that Russia perceives, there is no way that we can uh, win this war. And the best way really to perceive it is to understand that Russia understands information security from two different components, unlike we in the West. They combine cybersecurity and information operations. We divide oftentimes the two. Um, so I'm going to stop here, uh, and um, later I'm more than happy to talk about mm. all the details, how Russia is actually doing those things and the messages that still resonate. I'm actually going to follow up on, on what you said and, uh, and, and fire the first um, you know, uh, individual question to you. Would you characterize at the moment the Russian perception that they're winning? We know on the battlefield um, that can hardly be classed as winning with the stalemate, with the massive <clears throat> losses that they're uh, uh, you know, succumbing to. Um, but there seems to be a certain triumphalism on Russian state TV. And the propagandists who were quite depressed a month ago seem absolutely euphoric at the moment. Does this give us the impression that they believe they're winning the information war at this point? So you're absolutely right that Russia is struggling on the battlefield. But a lot of people in the West, because of such propaganda, they pick up those messages, whether they're coming um, uh, from the Russian channels, um, from Telegram that has immense, immense importance in this information battlefield. Um, uh, and then they get picked up by the Western uh, traditional media. And this is the chain that it goes. Um, I oftentimes hear, well, you know, but RT and Sputnik, they get like three likes on Twitter for their, uh, for their, for their tweets or X, whatever it's called now. It doesn't matter because the way that they do these things uh, is that uh, they're so-called journalists, they put information out there, they get picked up by uh, traditional media. Not only that, um, the Kremlin also operates through social media influencers. Some of them are paid, some of them are useful idiots, what we heard. And when you put information in a very quick way and in prompt way, it gets also picked up. Certainly, I'll just give an example here in the US, we have um, uh, where I currently live, uh, we were very successful during the Cold War with the Radio for Europe and the Voice of America. Um, nowadays, the problem with the traditional newspapers and how to, how to win this war, it's much more difficult because Russia can use black propaganda. Russia mm -hmm. can use grave propaganda. Russia can actually uh, fight this war with lies. We have in the West significantly more uh, obligations towards our citizens. We cannot do it in the same way and promptly in the way that, that Russia can. And this is um, why this war is so, if I may say, also unfair. Like how, how to fight this war as democracy against autocracy when our tools, we, I'm confident to say that we do have the tools in terms of knowledge, in terms of the means, in terms of the tools. But when the battlefield is so unfair, where Russia does not have to think about whether Putin will worry about his elections next year or not, uh, and whether uh, um, uh, Parliament there is going to call their intelligence, you know, for uh, to test, it, like to, to to provide the testimony on that. We have to worry about, and that's you know my concern about the 21st century information war: how to win this war as democracy 
by fighting lies uh, uh, given by autocracies. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute because there's been some interesting phenomena uh, to counter Russian propaganda mm -hmm. that have emerged mm -hmm. during the war. One of these is uh, a non-governmental uh, initiative. Uh, it's called NAFO. Uh, it was set up by a former Polish... I think he was a neo-Nazi, actually, but he's not anymore, so that's OK. Um, but it's a digital collective which uses memes and humour to fight Russian propaganda. It, however, creates a bubble. And when you're in that bubble, you think you're doing a tremendous amount of good. And you probably are for morale and raising awareness and funds. But you can also be blinded into the idea that this bubble is incredibly powerful and influential, when perhaps it's not. So we'll come back to some of the methodologies for counting propaganda in a minute. But let's, let's keep this idea of the strategic importance, because it's not always clear why Russian propaganda does what it does and why it pushes certain narratives until something happens later and you realise that it has a strategic either political, social, economic, or military objective behind it. So this is a question for, for Hannah here, um, and this is about the weaponization of the Russian language. And this is an extremely effective narrative, because many people have fallen into the idea that just because there are Russian speakers um, in the East and Central Ukraine and South Ukraine, that somehow they want to be part of the Russian state politically. Um, the question here is, how is Russia weaponizing the Russian language within Ukraine um, to set up the narrative that um, the end of the conflict would be a sort of frozen conflict where Russia comes to dominate a certain number of oblasts in the East, and somehow the people there, that's their desired outcome. Uh, most Ukrainians would find that idea horrific, but this narrative is very pervasive in the media, and I even hear it repeated by some experts. So could we, could we address how language is weaponized? Ви абсолютно праві у тому, що Росія використовує мову як інформаційний інструмент у цій війні. You are absolutely right. Russia indeed is using the language as an information tool in this war. Так історично сталося, що в усіх 15 республіках колишнього Радянського Союзу люди знають українську російську мову і багато хто нею спілкується у побутовому житті. Historically, through the after since the Soviet Union, uh, the people who live in uh, 15 former Soviet republics today, independent states, speak Russian and use it. Uh, a lot of them use it in their everyday life, especially when we talk about the generations which went to school before these countries' independence. Ну просто тому, що під час Радянського Союзу, наприклад, в Києві, де я вчилась, в тому районі не було українських шкіл, і так практично по всіх республіках відбувалося. This is the reality is precisely because there were no Ukrainian schools in most of the cities and villages of the former Soviet Union, uh, of, the, of Ukraine. And this was true for other countries in the former Soviet Union, for their native languages. The language they could learn in school, the only language, was Russian. And all of the disciplines were taught in Russian. Але це не означає, що люди втратили свою національну ідентичність. But this doesn't mean that the people uh, have lost their national identity. Uh, тепер Росія дійсно маніпулює мовою, забуваючи, що є національна ідентичність. Russia today is using the language as a tool of the war, manipulation, and uh, forgetting that those peoples have acquired national identity. Uh, на сьогодні в Україні немає такої проблеми, uh, але Росія намагається зробити інформаційний привід, ніби вона є, і вони самі її роздмухують. Language is not a problem in Ukraine today. Uh, can I add, можна додати, що на фронті, наприклад, це багато людей. Так, на фронті говорять як російською, так і українською мовою, скажімо, східні регіони. 
захищає місцева територіальна оборона, вони в побуті говорять російською, але вони повністю ідентично українці. For example, a lot of people on the front as well from the from the regions in the east and the south, they use Russian language and uh, uh, in, in their daily life, but identically they are Ukrainians. Але Росія з одного боку намагається інформаційно впливати по темі мови з іншого, те, що вони почали бомбити Україну, навіть етнічні росіяни перейшли на українську мову. But Russia is creating this problem artificially through information, um, through the uh, communication through the media about uh, the language as a problem, which doesn't exist. While after and since especially the massive bombings since February 2022, the people living in Ukraine, even those who are ethnically Russians and who have arrived to Ukraine from Russia recently, who lived there, they, even they, have now acquired and now share fully Ukrainian identity, and we can find them also fighting the war. І на початку великого вторгнення в 22-му році була дуже велика акція в соціальних мережах, коли росіяни етнічні просили Росію не захищати їх в Україні, що їм все добре. Uh, in the beginning of 2022, there was a big social networks campaign where ethnic Russians living in Ukraine went to ask publicly on social networks Russia not to protect them in Ukraine because there's nothing to protect them against. Тому, підсумовуючи, якби в Україні був мир, як до 2014-го, Росії дійсно вдавалося створювати з мови проблему. Після того, як вони вторглись в Україну і почали бомбити наші міста, вони самі позбавили себе цієї можливості. Тепер цієї проблеми, дійсно, цієї дискусії навіть в Україні немає. Language was a subject of a discussion in Ukraine before 2014. Uh, but since 2014 and Russian incursion into the east of Ukraine uh, since then and the annexation of Crimea as well, Krim uh, this language is not anymore for Ukrainians a, a subject of division. And uh, basically it's, it's not an issue. That's fantastic. Well, we'll come back to that because there's, there's, there's some other extraordinary ways in which Russia weaponizes culture, language and other things. Let's turn to Michael next. And propaganda narratives will also have their counterpart in so-called active measures. Uh, so this will be a Russian sort of secret service activity that goes hand in hand with these activities. And we're seeing this unfold at the moment in the Polish truckers blockade in Poland and in uh, Slovakia. Obviously, Hungary is involved. No one is particularly surprised at that. Um, but it is holding up huge amounts of humanitarian aid, supplies, uh, medical military supplies, tourniquets, and so on. It's not yet critical, but it has caused a spike in some fuel prices. And of course, morally, it's an absolutely disgusting thing to do. Um, a country at war to, to block the supplies on the border is morally reprehensible. So I've been doing a bit of analysis on media reporting, and around 80% of the sort of recycled online media doesn't even make mention that the ringleaders of these strikes have direct connections to often far-right organizations and have expressed uh, you know, extreme support for the occupation of Donbass, Crimea, and so on. So this is a double barrel question here. One is, how do active measures work hand in hand with uh, propaganda to help Russia meet its strategic objectives? And why is a lot of the media so poor in its analysis of actually showing, you know, the strategic reasons behind it, rather than just, you know, reporting the superficial events? Thank you. Maybe I'll take the, the first part uh, of your question. Uh, and having just uh, come back through one of those Polish crossings, and it's, it's difficult to over, overstate how dire the situation is with you know, over 6,000 trucks at the border, snow on the ground, reports of Ukrainian truck drivers who've 
passed away from hypothermia. Uh, it's a disaster at these crossings, and it's jamming up other movement of peoples as well. Uh, and one of the big impacts of this, of course, is going to be one of Ukraine's great allies in this war, and historically a country that has had many issues and disputes that have been put to the side that Russia has also loved to gin up and activate, you know, whether that's what happened in Berlin in the Second World War, all sorts of other history that's, you know, that, that's just waiting to be addressed down the road. It's unfortunate that now this has come up because Poland is one of the top three countries. If you ask Ukrainians who has done the most for Ukraine, Poland, top mm -hmm. three strong. I, mm -hmm. I unfortunately feel that that will be going down steadily over this winter period. Russia is very good at taking advantage of opportunities. They're fast. They can see where these divisions are. And of course, they also are very good at looking at a calendar. And they know when elections are happening. And so I also think it's we shouldn't overestimate the power of a couple individuals in <coughs> manipulating an entire trucker association. There are deep economic issues here. I mean, there are economic issues related to some of the guarantees Ukraine was given regarding tariffs by Brussels to move grain through Poland, not resell it. Mm -hmm. And there are many stories of Polish farmers working with Ukrainian distributors to get a good deal on reselling grain within Poland. So the problems on both sides, and it's, and it's a deep economic issue uh, here, exacerbated by one of the most contentious elections in Polish mm -hmm. political history. We're now seeing that happen in Slovakia. I think one of the things we have to remember is many of us exist, you mentioned NAFO, we exist in these little online Twitter bubbles where we think you know, we're, we're winning, everyone's on our side, but people are tired. You know, no one wants the war to end more than people in Ukraine. No one wants to get back to their lives like those of us in Europe and elsewhere. And the economic impacts are something that Russia is very good at measuring and timing these around elections and then exploiting them. And it doesn't take much. Uh, as mentioned earlier, some of this content just has to be put out there. And then it's immediately amplified by mainstream media and elsewhere. And we lose the essence. I do think also just the, your final point, just briefly on media, uh, focus is everywhere. I think we have far too much media in Kyiv right now, going back and forth between the general staff and Bankova, trying to get a good <coughs> story about who's angry at who, and we're losing focus on some of the bigger picture issues, unfortunately. Mm. We'll come to that one uh, in a minute, because it does seem that, again, Russia has been very effective at amplifying that and using even the opposition media to do that uh, in the Russian diaspora. Um, <coughs> but I wanted to carry on from, from your answer there and turn to Ivana, because... It is not just disinformation narratives trying to divide allies from Ukraine. There is a strong current here of countries that are already what could be classed anti-Ukraine. Not, not entire countries, but there are certainly governments uh, and, and, and influential people. We talk here about, obviously, Hungary uh, and Serbia, uh, who are predominantly sort of pro-Russian in their outlook. And then there are Slovakia and Turkey, which will contain many pro-Ukrainian people, but also you'll find governments there hedging their bets uh, and supporting both sides, uh, et cetera, potentially um, for profit. Um, the disinformation kind of narratives are going to be different, aren't they, in allies compared to, uh, or allies of Ukraine compared to allies of Russia. Uh, what sort of narratives do you see working in countries like Hungary, Serbia, Turkey, and so on? So first and foremost, Russia is certainly trying to get more allies on its side, not only in the global south, but also in Europe. Um, and on the streets of Belgrade in Serbia, you will see more pictures of Putin probably than in Moscow. And people from Russia who fled to Serbia, even they are appalled by the support of Serbia uh, towards Russia. Um, it is in part because of culture, because of religion, uh, but it's also in part because the government of Serbia has been trying to balance between um, East and West, um, and Moscow has been a very, very useful um, ally in that, um, in that game that the president of Serbia um, is playing, and not only that, Putin perfectly also understands by exploiting those issues, um, by investing in Serbia, it means that he can always use that as a trigger uh, to uh, trigger more problems in the Western Balkans, whether what we just saw recently in, in Kosovo or whether what is happening right now in Bosnia-Herzegovina with the latest secessionist threats. 
And I always like to say, Putin does not need to uh, roll on his tanks to Poland. All he truly needs to do is to challenge NATO um, where NATO has weak links um, and to show that NATO is a paper tiger and that NATO will do nothing. What happened a few months ago when more than 30 NATO peacekeepers were injured in Kosovo, what did NATO do? Just, pers just pursued like another message we are gravely concerned, which is exactly what Putin wants. When it comes to Hungary, Putin has a different game. Putin understands that Hungary is a Trojan horse, what I like to call him, uh, uh, Orban in the European Union. Uh, and the way that Russia operates over there is something that Russia is also using right now in the United States by uh, <clears throat> pushing the agenda of Russia as a protector of spiritual, more and traditional values. And that is something that is picked up by, by the uh, 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 by Orban, who is now pushing that agenda in the European Union, that it is Hungary that is the protector of <clears throat> traditional, more and spiritual values, unlike the decadent West. Um, in addition to that, um, Orban also is trying to put the agenda um, that we should, uh, uh, that it's not in, in Hungary's interest uh, to, uh, to spend money on Ukraine, but why that actually matters with the rise of the far right groups in Europe, uh, that messaging resonates with a lot of, uh, uh, I don't wanna say a lot of people, but with some people certainly in the West. And I'm afraid that that's the narrative um, that, will, that will grow. Um, um, and for example, Russia does not need to, um, Putin does not need to himself like to project the narrative of protecting traditional more and spiritual values, he can always do that through proxies, whether through Serbia or, or, or Hungary. And you also asked me about uh, Turkey and, um, and, and uh, Slovakia. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I mean, wherever you know, Putin can exploit those issues, he is going to use those polarizations to exploit. Certainly, Turkey also uh, is a frenemy, I would say, of, of Russia, which means that they are also friends, but also enemies in certain areas. So wherever there is any sort of polarization, it is really a dream come true uh, for, uh, for Putin. Um, in Slovakia, certainly, you know, what we saw uh, just, just recently, it's uh, another avenue <coughs> where, where, where Putin can have, you know, his allies to promote, you know, such agendas. Um, I will stop here, mm. and I'm happy to... I'd like to throw the next question at you as well, uh, because it, it, yes, but it, it follows on from there, and that is that this is also working in certain quarters of the Republican Party, the sort of right wing of the GOP, uh, MAGA, and you know, uh, various sort of uh, sections that are perhaps allied with that, um, certainly uh, uh, as well the evangelical Christian side. And again, Russian... Uh, disinformation has been described as a fire hose of falsehood, I think, if you've heard that phrase. And the idea is that it just spews out many, many, many different narratives, um, some of them completely contradictory, like throwing spaghetti at the wall in the hope that some sticks. But Russia also knows its audience. And I wanted to throw some of these recent propaganda narratives, which do seem to be cutting through very effectively with certain parts of the GOP, and, as we see, have undermined uh, the vote for the most recent age package, which is absolutely critical. One of these is that Zelensky has banned the Christian church uh, in Ukraine, which, mm -hmm. if you know a little bit about it, is kind of uh, absurd. Um, banning orthodoxy itself, that Zelensky has tons and tons of yachts, etc., etc. So they're, they're doing the religion, identity, language, and, of course, the corruption cards. These seem to work, however, in some quarters of the GOP. So oftentimes when we are talking about elections interference in Russia, people in the West you know, focus specifically on the elections interference. That's not how the Kremlin operates. Kremlin operates 24 seven. And let me remind you that Vladimir Putin is, has been, was, whatever you wanna put it, a KGB agent, he's not a military guy. If there is one thing that he perfectly understands is to exploit vulnerabilities of his opponents. What he perfectly also understands in the United States is that um, the GOP uh, truly cares about uh, protecting 
spiritual and traditional values. And there has been a true polarization in the United States between the far, far right and the far <laughs> left. And the far left, according to the far right, has been promoting uh, Vogue uh, uh, narratives and the decadent values. What a great opportunity for Russia to stir and to further polarize it. I'll just give you an example, very, very concrete example, that is rooted in national security strategy of Russia. If you read carefully documents, Russian cybersecurity strategy, what I call information security, openly talks about the protecting traditional spiritual and moral values. Put it in a national security document. A few months ago, Russia just adopted a new foreign policy uh, document where one of the key questions, one of the key points, was indeed the protection of spiritual and moral values. How does it now translate in the United States? Uh, they are using exactly uh, uh, the war in Ukraine to show that Ukrainians are destroying Christianity. How many Americans do even understand, for example, the division between uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church? Uh, they are also using exactly what you just mentioned, the narratives about the corruption, um, about you know, promoting all those uh, decadent values. But the truth is really, if I may say, also on our side, because I always like to say if evangelicals, for example, believe um, that Russia is the protector of spiritual and moral values, let's talk about abortion rates in Russia. Let's talk about divorce rates in Russia. When it comes to corruption, it is Patriot Kirill or Russia who was caught to wear $40,000 watch, um, who has been flying with his fancy uh, uh, jet. It is Patriot Kirill who was also caught uh, uh, to have a yacht. Mm -hmm. All those information are actually uh, on, on our mm -hmm. side. Too bad that we are not using that to promote the truth and to expose uh, Russian lies by promoting uh, the truth. Yeah. The and they will hate yeah. it. The next question is for Pauline. So, so far we've been imagining countries and territories which <clears throat> Russia seeks to manipulate and control uh, their actions and the strategic decisions. Let's turn now to what Russia actually does when it militarily controls a territory. Because Pauline and her colleagues have done some excellent reporting on how Russia has created institutions or schools, a class of anti-journalism in the occupied territories. So it's an entire infrastructure that does the opposite of what traditional journalism would do. It teaches people how to lie effectively, how to hack people's brains and control their behavior. So you could describe a little bit of the reporting there and how these institutions are set up, run, and what the objective is and what, what kind of people they turn out. So you're right. These are networks that were created by Russia and Russian forces in the occupied territories of Ukraine, so in all the occupied territories. Um, it is not easy to know the weight of these schools. So these are propaganda schools for new journalism, journalists in those territories. But they are aiming to raise and to gather a new generation of journalists in the occupied territories among the Ukrainian population living under the occupation. But it is not journalism because they are just using the fact that there are some young people there that, that, will, get, that will join the schools, but they are very impressionable people and they, mm -hmm. some of them don't have any choice and some of them are just like gathered because they are part of all the pro-Russian movements such as uh, Young Maladoy in those occupied territories. So what, uh, why are they doing so? Um, Russia is lacking of professional journalists in the occupied territories because Ukrainian journalists, some of them decided to flee because they had to flee. Some of them refused to work with the Russian propaganda machine. Okay. And those who are still trying or working as independent are taken into jail, they are hunting down, media outlets are closed. So Russia is lacking of human resources in a way to, to join its propaganda network channels, its propaganda machine. Um, thus, having those 
courses for, for aspiring journalists is a way to face and to deal with this problem. Uh, that's true that uh, Reporters Without Borders published uh, this year a report about the Malkevich network in the southeast of Ukraine. So Alexander Malkevich, which, who is a <coughs> Russian propagandist, very close, was very close to Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner's panda, and also to uh, the Russian politics, such as the governor of uh, St. Peter mm -hmm. Petersburg, he created uh, in the Zaporizhia region a full networks of media named the media, which is concretely and media that are just diffusing the Russian propaganda. He also created a school for aspirants journalists in Kherson when uh, the city was still occupied. These media have a huge impact. They are accessible on social media, they are accessible online. Uh, they are promoting Russian propaganda. Most, more recently, we also worked on a northern network in Melitopol, so again in the Zaporizhia region in the southeast of Ukraine, of a school that was created for, to train new journalists. Uh, it's named Mediatopol. So this is a school uh, that aims to, again, gather a new generation of so-called journalists in a few months. Uh, from September to December 2023, the idea uh, that was shared and uh, communicated is to train 100 new journalists that will after gather and join the Russian propaganda machine. But for you to understand those journalists or so-called journalists, aspirant journalists, some of them are 14, some of them are 18, some of them are 19. So it's really to, they are really focusing on young, non-experienced people to join the machine because they are facing, of, uh, they are facing the lack of professional, Ukrainian journalists professional who agree to work with them. And all of those schools uh, have really close ties with Russian media, with Russian movement, young movement, and uh, they are going to some seminars in Russia with young journalists and so on. So there is a really well-structured network in the occupied territory that we play. The next question is for uh, Hanna Malia, and this is about Russian propaganda. Um, Recently, Margarita Simonyan, who is one of the leading propagandists on Russian state TV, pronounced with no hint of irony at all that it was Russia's historic mission to save the world and defend freedom. This is in the same month where they put someone in prison for seven years for altering the price tags in supermarkets with anti-war messages. So the, the sort of horrible irony of this is, is really not lost on most people. The trouble is if you understand Russian and you watch enough <coughs> Russian propaganda, you will realize that the genocidal messaging is not a one-off. It is absolutely baked into Russian propaganda. On almost any given day, you will have the most extreme genocidal pronouncements. The shock for me is not listening to this stuff anymore, but that it is the impact of it is not fully being conveyed or understood in the Western media. So the question for Hannah is, what we should we be saying and telling people about the genocidal content <coughs> of Russian propaganda, which is translating into actions in the occupied territories, which are essentially living under a neo-Stalinist um, kind of existence? Я би хотіла уточнити щодо церкви. Україна багато конфесійна держава, і українська православна церква отримала Томос в Константинополі, і є окремою церквою, українська православна церква, і її ніхто не забороняв. 
b before just getting to the question, I would like to address one point that you raised, Jonathan, before mm -hmm. on the from the closure of the pro pro uh, Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and uh, just to distinguish between two types of Orthodox Church in mm -hmm. Ukraine. One is Moscow Patriarchy, and that's the one which is now obviously you know, used by Russia and also for for different purposes, and is basically targeted by the Ukrainian government. And then there is a Ukrainian Orthodox Church which uh, received independence uh, by the Constantinople Patriarchy uh, in uh, 2019, and, uh, the, and that is a different story. So just to kind of make a dif distinction before we continue with the question. But in Ukraine there is a Moscow Church, and it is just a filial of Russian special services, so, of course, it was banned during the war. And during the war, the Moscow Patriarchy was is prohibited uh, because it is considered to be just a, a subdivision of uh, Moscow service, secret services. Yeah. Yeah. Щодо феномену російської пропаганди. As for the Russian propaganda. А вони uh, вкладають, по-перше, в це великі гроші. Жодна країна не готова стільки витрачати на пропаганду. Russia is spending much more money on propaganda than any other country. Тому вони беруть не тільки якістю, вони беруть кількістю. So it's not just the quality, it's also the quantity that counts. А ми підраховували і аналізували кількість повідомлень в нашому інформаційному середовищі під час активних бойових дій. То дійсно з російського боку їх в десятки разів більше, тому що вони більше в це вкладають грошей. We have try to estimate how many messages in social networks the Russians are posting about war during the actual actions and during the actual uh, fighting on the front. And there are tens and hundreds and thousands more than uh, what we are generating uh, because they are investing so much more money into this. Um, the most impact Russian propaganda has on the Russians themselves. А їм складніше працювати з українцями. Because for them it makes it much more difficult to work with Ukrainians. А їхня пропаганда будується на потребах російського громадянина, які вони цією пропагандою задовільняють і обіцяють. The Russian propaganda is built, built on the needs of a Russian citizen, uh, which the propaganda tries to fulfill. Наприклад, після розпаду Радянського Союзу у більшості росіян є психологічна травма, що їхня країна вже не така велика. For example, since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russians have this trauma that the empire is over, their country is not great anymore. І на цій травмі якраз грає їхня пропаганда, обґрунтовуючи вторгнення в Україну. And this trauma is what is being exploited by the Russian propaganda to explain and justify the incursion and the invasion of Ukraine. Я би ще хотіла торкнутися питання експансії російської культури. От це набагато небезпечніше, ніж їхня пряма пропаганда. And I'd like to also touch upon the question of Russian indirect propaganda, which pertains to the Russian culture. It is much more dangerous than this direct Russian propaganda when it comes to Ukraine. Вони дійсно вкладають дуже багато грошей для популяризації російської культури, в тому числі в Україні. Russia keeps investing a lot of money into the popularization of its own Russian culture, including in Ukraine. І ми досліджували цей цікавий ефект. Дійсно, якщо людина говорить в побуті російською мовою, з великою ймовірністю, вона слухає російські пісні. And we have uh, done research on this, and uh, indeed, if a person uses a Russian language in their everyday life, most likely they are going to listen to Russian popular songs. І тут Росія виконує дві задачі через пісні, через літературу. А це просування російського наративу. Through songs and literature, Russia is fulfilling two objectives. The first is the promotion of Russian narrative. І друге це, як не дивно, психологічна близькість людей, які слухали одні і ті ж пісні або дивилися одні і ті ж фільми. And the second is the creation of a perception of psychological proximity between the people who watch the same movies, listen to the same songs. А тому російська пропаганда, вона така груба і вона працює на росіян, а от російська експансія культури це більш тонкий нюанс. 
І вони його просувають не тільки в Україні, але й в країнах Європи і в Сполучених Штатах. So, the direct Russian propaganda is very rough. It works in Russia, doesn't work abroad. What works abroad is the more nuanced Russian propaganda, and it works not just in Ukraine, it works also in Europe and in the US, and that's the propaganda through culture. І uh, вони роблять це успішно, тому що з точки зору психології дуже складно uh, um, засуджувати країну, культуру якої ти любиш. This strategy has great success because psychologically it's very difficult to condemn a country the culture of which you love. Thank you. Yes, that's that's uh, that's a real challenge and if we take that and turn it to the west in Ukraine there has been many many I would call it a, a, an entrepreneurial boom in techniques and methods to try and counter propaganda and many, many experiments, some of which have worked well and some which have worked less well, but certainly Ukrainians, if, they're, if their first language is Ukrainian, have a little bit more immunity to some of these Russian narratives than perhaps we do in the West. So I'd like to turn to Michael and say, are we doing enough to inoculate ourselves against Russian propaganda? And I think the answer is probably going to be no. And what should we be doing uh, in order to try and increase, I think you mentioned earlier, information literacy amongst our populations? Well, certainly, you know, so the answer is no, we're not doing enough. Uh, but the, the, the full answer would be no, we're not doing enough. I think, you know, you look at not just the United States, but elsewhere, the, the lack of and the removal of civics in schools. Uh, you know, we can talk about media literacy, but media literacy is really about learning basic facts when you're young that ground and root your thinking and critical thinking going forward. We've gotten rid of that in most, at least in the West, in the United States, in our education system. Uh, what can be done? So yes, we can return to that. We can talk about media literacy. There are many organizations. You know, Ukraine is one where you do see organizations piloting a number of media literacy programs. Uh, and it's not just for young people, older voters as well. So there's a lot of room there. But I would also argue that there's, you know, there's not a one-stop technological solution to this either. And oftentimes it's not countering the argument and saying, no, 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 you're not correct. It's, you need to show a new narrative. And here, speaking specifically about Ukraine, uh, I do feel there's been a very a missed opportunity in the last 20 months or so to present the new narrative. We talked a bit about the church and some of these things that are just so ridiculous to us that follow this, that know that absolutely absurd. But how many Protestant delegations have visited the United States and gone to churches in the, in the South and the West? How many delegations of Ukraine parliamentarians, soldiers, veterans, returned prisoners have visited the M1 Abrams tank factory in Lima, Ohio, whose congressional representatives vote no on Ukraine aid, and yet whose own residents are working triple shifts and the tax revenue has gone up, unfortunately. But again, this way of making a connection Ukraine has seemed to have doubled down on this idea we need to reach out to the global south. I, I want to be a bit provocative and say to win more votes in the United Nations, does Ukraine need to expand its presence in Khartoum and Kinshasa, or should we have 80 excellent English-speaking diplomats in Washington across the United States at consulates regularly traveling? I don't think the embassy has expanded at all since the war began. Yep. You certainly wouldn't see this in, in a conflict where the United States was engaged. You would definitely know where our embassy was, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, I think this is an area where there's much more room to be done. Alexander Turchinov, fifth president of Ukraine, Baptist minister, acting president, passed on power after elections to President Poroshenko. Mayor Alexander Tretiak, evangelical minister, mayor of Rivni in Western Ukraine. The list goes on. The largest menorah was just lit in Kyiv last night. These are missed opportunities that we think the world is paying attention to, but unless folks are going and delivering these messages and sharing new narratives, they're not going to see this. And, and there's some powerful stories. There's uh, one uh, prisoner of war who was recently released, and he told his Russian captors that he was uh, not an Orthodox, but a, a, an evangelical Christian, and he was tortured more intensively as a result. These yeah. are stories which, which need to be told. And absolutely. And, and again, the war goes back over 10 years, and the first, some of the first atrocities ever recorded with the outbreak of Russia's hybrid invasion were in Donetsk and Horlivka, mm -hmm. where you had Protestant parishioners and pastors who were summarily executed uh, behind their church. So these stories are there, 
we're not telling them. We're relying on tech and Twitter and all of these fun ways to get the message out. But we need more of this direct people-to-people -people engagement uh, to begin presenting these new narratives and actual connections with these individuals. Um, the next question is for uh, Ivana. And this is about purpose behind many of the Russian narratives that are being spread. And in particular, they want to limit the supply of Western support, arms and assistance, but they also want to discourage us from, I think, taking the gloves off and properly showing strength uh, to Russia. And some of these have been, unfortunately, very effective. And in this, we are assuming that the propaganda narrative and actions on the ground are not always the same thing. Here are a couple of example ones which I'd like Ivana to address. One is that Putin's successor is going to be far worse than Putin. We wouldn't like him. Let's not push Russia too far. Another one is that Russian Federation is so fragile, it's going to collapse. We wouldn't like that. There will be multiple uh, mafia nuclear states, etc., etc. This is a narrative pushed by the GRU itself. Um, so that the, you know, it's not necessarily true. It's something they want us to believe. And, of course, the big one throughout this war has been the so-called nuclear threat. So could you discuss the narratives, but also what their strategic intent is? Certainly. So one of the key components <laughs> that the Kremlin has been pushing um, in the West, but especially in the United States, is to make sure that we stop providing support for Ukraine. And the only way that we can stop providing support for Ukraine is out of fear. As soon as the war, full-fledged uh, invasion started last year, the threat of nuclear weapons immediately popped up. Out of blue, like even in Washington, you could hear all those stories about Russia has nuclear weapons, it's going to be Armageddon. And Putin, as an intelligence officer, he absolutely, as I mentioned, understands uh, vulnerability of his opponents. He understands what will resonate with people in the <coughs> West. And people do remember the Cold War. Some people do remember the Cold War. Some people do remember the threats of uh, nuclear weapons. And in Russian security strategy also has another um, uh, thing that we do not have here in the West, which is called reflexive control, <coughs> which is a key component by basically feeding your opponent with information that he or she is taking certain actions that benefit um, basically Russia, but you are thinking that it's going to benefit you. And that's exactly how Russian threats when it comes to nuclear weapons uh, still work. Uh, when it comes to, after Putin, someone else will actually, uh, uh, like an Arishkin or Patrushin, mm -hmm. will take over, um, that's another uh, fear that Russia has been pushing here. Well, you know, Putin is bad, but the alternative will be even worse. Uh, and they also understand that that's also something that he has. Like, we don't like Putin, but we can manage him. We already understand to some extent uh, his intentions, his limitations, and his uh, capabilities. And one other thing that you mentioned, it's very, very actually interesting when it comes to um, uh, the West should fear the collapse of, of Russia. But indeed, even Arishkin himself, um, he recently uh, published a piece exactly about the fear of Russia collapsing and triggering new secessionist movements. So they already believe that we are indeed triggering secessionist movements. I'll just give an example. What happened a few weeks ago in Dagestan uh, with uh, um, in, in Dagestan um, in Dagestan airport uh, related to Hamas issue, immediately Putin went on the news and he accused the West, actually the CIA, of organizing the Dagestan uh, uh, mm -hmm. chaos. And then they linked it and then they said, but the reason why they're doing that, it is because they want Dagestan to become an independent uh, from the rest of Russia. They are doing the same thing with Patterson, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, you know, their fear. They genuinely believe that we are triggering secessionist movements, and that's how it resonates actually here also in the West. Well, you know, if we uh, face the collapse of Russia, we can actually face the collapse of uh, uh, different states exactly having like a nuclear weapons or different uh, 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 
mafia, you know, taking over. So all those fears, indeed, unfortunately, you know, still, uh, still resonate, mm -hmm. uh, resonate here. Absolutely. And I, I spoke to a journalist who has been working in Moscow throughout, who spoke to Dmitry Peskov, uh, unfortunately for her, and he privately said, uh, or he, she overheard a conversation, where they are absolutely paranoid about the Russian Federation collapsing. I think this is one area where propaganda and their paranoid beliefs do actually overlap. But it's also been very effective at preventing us from arming Ukraine for victory. Mm -hmm. um, with that, it's probably a good opportunity to open up to the questions and answers. When you put your question, could you please indicate which member of the panel you would like to pose it towards as well? And introduce yourself, please. And introduce yourself, yes. Ukrainian Baptists and Chautauqua shows throughout the United States to get the American public back on board with this. <clears throat> so do you really think there's time? Do you really think that's going to work in time? Because Americans, by all account, don't care about Ukraine anymore. They're, more, they're struggling with uh, mortgages, car payments, student loans, groceries, medical costs. This is why the Senate knocked down this $60 billion. And even the OMB says there's not enough money in the pot to make the Ukraine shortfall. It's, it's a horrible situation. You know, I mean, is there something that can be done immediately, quick time, some kind of super vaccine that can fix this before everyone forgets about Ukraine entirely? I certainly hope so. I think, you know, the phrase, it's better late than never. Uh, I mean, this, these are the types of things that should have been rolled out at the very beginning to engage with the United States uh, directly, with the American people. You know, the United States is more than just Washington. It's more than just walking around Capitol Hill knocking on doors. It's going to those factories and plants and saying thank you, bringing a piece of a Russian tank, connecting, giving them a story. Uh, the public diplomacy piece, I think, again, going back to that, and not to beat on that too much, but that's just one area, again, from where I'm sitting in Kyiv, that I think we've really missed because so much of this looks like low-hanging fruit. All of these stories, these personal narratives, the real situation on the ground, uh, and smart Ukrainians that would be willing to do that, and that hasn't been utilized. Is there time? Of course there's time. But I'm speaking as an American, we're always optimistic, and I'm th so I'm going to say yes. Uh, I have staff on the front line, so I certainly hope there's time and that it works. Uh, and I also think we have a Christmas recess coming up, and Congress can be extremely efficient when there's a long holiday coming up. And so as soon as we get, I think, all of that that's happening behind closed doors wrapped up, I think we, sitting in Ukraine, underestimate what's happening in the U.S. media narrative on the situation with the border. Uh, obviously, that's a major domestic concern. And so this is all being packaged up now into this very large spending bill. Uh, but I remain confident. Can I, can I add to that and ask uh, an extension of that? One of the biggest issues, it seems, or the excuse that's been given to block the package, is southern border security. What we've seen, however, in Europe is Russia throwing migrants at the Polish border, throwing migrants at other borders in order to destabilize societies. Is there any evidence at all of Russia working through criminal gangs to promote this issue in the US? That might be a way, if that could be proved, to make that relevant to a US audience. Yep, thank you, thank you. 
Thank you very much for the, uh, for the, um, for the speech uh, this morning. Um, I have a question, I don't know to whom. Uh, please, please present yourself. I'm Nicola Audier, I'm from, uh, uh, I was an uh, auditor at the IHDN uh, years ago, uh, 19, uh, 2000, um, I mean, 63e promotion, sorry. Um, no, I had a, a question because propaganda is something which is, has been existing for 2,000 years, so it's not very new uh, today. What is changing in today in, to, in the 21st century, the means which amplify the, the propaganda, and uh, mainly the GAFA. Uh, a few days ago, we had the chance to receive here uh, one of the MEP in Europe, which is actu who is actually working on the uh, cyber securities and to protect information, and, uh, and that was part of the EU. And my point to you, to probably to you, uh, uh, Ivana, and to Michael, because you are, you are American, what is the position of the US government to protect uh, the fake information which is given by the social network, basically, Facebook and uh, Google and all of that? So what is your position? The EU position is quite strict on that. Now they are fighting against TikTok, which is a fake, uh, they provide fake news. They managed to get some agreement with the big GAFA, but what do you do in the US to, to ensure that they provide good information? Thank you. Uh, certainly not enough. Um, <coughs> I do believe that today the situation is significantly better than a few years ago, but then there is another caveat there. In the US, we pay so much attention uh, to the free speech, which we should which is exactly the point that Russia loves to exploit. By weaponizing again, both the far right and the far left fighting each other over free speech and how we should protect information. And this is in part why the US government has certain limitations on what they can do um, as of today, unlike uh, in the European Union. We do have, for example, the Global Engagement Center which has, done, which has done a very important work when it comes to uh, writing reports, exposing Russia propaganda, or the Chinese or from other countries, that's not enough. To put it bluntly, I do read those reports because they are immensely important for my research. I doubt that any of my friends who are not in this field ever open their website. That is not enough during the Cold War to put it also bluntly, the US was the superpower when it comes to information warfare. Um, we uh, had done amazing things when it comes to uh, the Voice of America or Radio for Europe and for people who are uh, from um, Eastern Europe, um, they probably remember very well how those two outlets uh, played tremendously important role. We used back then modern art, culture, etc., cetera, uh, jazz music as a powerful weapon to fight, uh, to fight the Soviet Union. Those tools, unfortunately, today, they're not going to be very, uh, very effective because uh, we live in times of globalization, so anyone can just listen to Lady Gaga or you know, any, any other American uh, uh, famous uh, singer or to read for that respect any books, et cetera. So we are, when it comes to this type of things, on the defensive. I also do not believe um, that the U.S. is taking enough measures when it comes to offensive information operations. Um, uh, um, again, you know, that's the part of the IC community, so who knows, you know, what's happening really out there, but we, we would not be sitting here if the U.S. was doing a much better job. Mm -hmm. uh, so having said that, I don't believe that as of today, the U.S. is uh, uh, doing uh, 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 much, you know, in, 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 this, uh, in this area, but it does not mean that the United States is not waking up to the threat of this. Because information, as I said, it is a weapon. Uh, the problem in the U.S. is the polarization that our adversaries have been, um, have been uh, exploiting, you know, uh, for years. Uh, so I hope this thing is going to change. And you said propaganda has existed for a thousand years. I think there's a, one of the questions I wanted to ask Ivana in the session, which I think is important to this, is there's a qualitative difference between the propaganda. During the Soviet Union, it was ideological propaganda. Mm. Therefore, we could fight it with political and cultural values and get a certain unanimity. Russian propaganda is not about convincing us of anything at the moment. It is nihilistic. It is there to divide us from ourselves, it is there to erode and destroy our values. And I think that is one of the challenges that we have in fighting it. 
should I respond yes, to this? Just, just, just briefly, a little, maybe yeah. just two sentences to this. It's much easier to destroy than to build. Okay. What we just learned, yes, Russia has amazing culture. Like, I love to uh, play piano and, and, Russian, uh, and Russian composers. I really do. Um, but that's the weapon that Russia has been using also uh, against us. But even that is not even powerful enough. The, the reason why I still firmly believe, and some of my colleagues might disagree with me, that Russia is still winning in the information war, it is because it's destroying, it's not building, and it's exploiting our vulnerabilities. And I'll just finish with this sentence by citing, unfortunately, Russian military strategists who openly claim who has information superiority will win this war. So I'm very pleased, you know, that this panel was number one, uh, because probably if this was held in Moscow, this is why they would put it uh, as well as a panel number one, given how they value information. <coughs> Next question, please. Gentleman in blue. I, um, I, I'm a European. As simple as that. I have two questions to ask you. Um, I agree. The U.S. has need needs to uh, they they need to to understand the people need to understand that uh, <coughs> they, they have to win this war. Ukraine has to win this war <coughs> by by giving up by abandoning uh, Ukraine, which uh, the U.S. is to me is doing right now. Russia <coughs> is allied to China. <coughs> uh, China has done nothing to help. So in fact, there's an enormous. Uh, there's enormous danger of, in fact, uh, strengthening China here and, uh, a, a, as a result, in fact, showing that the U.S. Is, is, is a paper tiger. That's the first point I want to make. The second point, um, and I think, uh, I, I don't know, perhaps uh, Michael uh, Druckmann here. It strikes me that we can really strike uh, the Russians when it comes to values, traditional values. First point, the very first country in the world, the very first government that introduced abortion was Russia. In 1917, it was Lenin. They have an incredibly high divorce rate. I looked up this morning. It's 65%. I regret to say that Ukraine was 67%, so I was, I was wondering what's happening uh, there. Uh, we, we see the way they have, uh, uh, the, the, the massive corruption that which they have in, uh, in Russia, uh, we can really laugh about uh, the various oligarchs who uh, fall out of uh, either windows or planes or, or, or what have you. We've seen all the crimes that have been ha happening in uh, Ukraine. I am just very surprised that in the US uh, that somehow newspapers, uh, Facebook and what have you is unable to, uh, to, to, to really to demonstrate to... Uh, to uh, explain to their fellow American citizens just what the hell is going on. You, 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 want, you want the panel to react to that, right? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I would Thank like you. you to react. <laughs> yeah. uh, who would like to, to, to take Very shortly. I don't think that's really a question, but no, I'm surprised as well. Next question. Then <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Some, for, some, for some reason, nobody's picking up. Maybe a question. A question. Ah, yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. well, what is the question? Because I think that's what they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Ukraine. Yeah. And the question is. I can answer that question. Um, the easy answer is yes, indeed, because this war uh, is the war between autocracy and democracy. This war we have a new, whether some people love this term or not, new axis of evil between Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And we have to understand this war through those lenses. This war is not only about Ukraine. It has much bigger component and much greater effort uh, in this. So uh, indeed, yes. 
Please, gentlemen. Two uh, short and related questions. The first one, uh, so first please of introduce all, yourself. I'm Jean Louis Mernier, researcher at Ecole Polytechnique near Paris. Um, <coughs> first of all, I'm wondering how come Slovakia could have changed more or less side recently? What was, in terms of information, the reason behind uh, this election results? And the second, completely unrelated question is how the situation in uh, Gaza and Israel is going to change the situation regarding information on Ukraine. Thank you. Не варто протиставляти ситуацію в Ізраїлі українській і штучно робити з них конкурентів в інформаційному полі. Uh, let's not compare and contrast uh, the situation in Israel and in Ukraine in the information field. Uh, всі війни uh, в світі uh, це ознака того, що людство не навчилося їм протистояти. Every war is a sign that the humanity hasn't learned to prevent it. І такі події навпаки повинні об'єднувати до пошуку інструментів зупинення війни, тому що це ганьба для 21-го століття такі війни. The phenomena that we have two wars going on in parallel should not disrupt us and separate us. They should unite us in the effort to uh, respond to this because it's a shame that in the 21st century we can still have wars like this. Це природньо, якщо більше півтора роки триває велике вторгнення в Україні, що інформаційний інтерес спадає. It's normal that after a year and a half or almost two years of war in Ukraine, the information cycle has been turning and the interest is now lower. Але допомога Україні не повинна залежати від інформаційного інтересу. But the, help, the aid to Ukraine cannot depend on the information cycle. Тому що війна – це не про інформаційний інтерес, війна – це про те, що норми і принципи міжнародного права не дотримуються і ніхто нічого не може з цим зробити. Because the war is not about the information cycle. The war is about the breaking of international law the norms and principles of it, and the fact that they are broken and nobody can do anything about it. Anybody wants to take the first question? Regarding Slo Slovakia? For example. I have nothing else to add to that other than, as I mentioned earlier, if there is one thing that Putin is truly good at, is finding people and finding all those opportunities that he can exploit. And Slovakia is certainly you know, one of them. And uh, I, I still believe that there is a chance you know, that Slovakia can be on the, right, uh, on the right track. I'm just concerned that that pattern uh, will be a lesson also for other countries, especially next year during EU elections, et cetera, that we might actually see. That's my bigger concern when it comes to uh, what's, what just happened in Slovakia. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panel. I'm going to take the, I'm going to be John's voice to end right. it. I see that. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan Fink, Ivana Stradner, uh, Jean Cavalier, and Michael Druckmann, and uh, Hannah Maller. Thank you very much. Thank you.